begin our second session. We're looking at the subject of church discipline this evening, as we have been since Wednesday evening. We'll be continuing the study uh, through this hour, and we'll have two hours of study tomorrow morning. We are at the point where we're asking the question, who is responsible for taking disciplinary action? And it's an important question. We need to know, is this my responsibility? Who, whose responsibility is it? And, and who takes that responsibility? At what, uh, it, are there layers or, or certain stages in which we do this? And this was one of the questions that I had about church discipline. What is my role? What is my responsibility? So as we ask that question, who's responsible for taking action? Well, the first person responsible for taking action is the individual Christian. It doesn't need to start, per se, with church action. It starts with the individual Christian. And maybe not what you're expecting, but where it really needs to start first is toward ourself. The very first area that I have a responsibility in, and I'm the first line of defense in church discipline, and that first act of church discipline is for me to discipline myself. You know, that's what he's talking about here in Matthew chapter 7. And in verse 1, he said, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I want you to notice as he's telling us this, he's talking about the fact that we have a responsibility to ourself first. I need to be examining myself constantly, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. And in doing that, I've got to make sure that I'm taking care of those issues that need to be taken care of. Now, a lot of people will look at this text and say, well, see, we're not supposed to be judging anyone. That's not what he's saying. He's saying don't judge by a measure that you don't level toward yourself. That's what he's saying. He's not saying don't ever judge because look at verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. How am I going to know who the dogs and the hogs are if I don't make some discernment and judgment? No, he's not saying don't judge at all. He's going to go on and talk about uh, in the, uh, the tree that bears good fruit, verse 18, 19, and 20, and the tree that bears bad fruit. And he said, you'll know them by the fruit that they bear. There's judgment. No, he's not saying not to judge. He's saying that we need to apply the same standard to others that we do apply to ourselves, and that standard of judgment is right here. That's what I need to be applying. But it needs to start with me. And, and I want you to notice another point. He says in verse uh, 5, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to what? Remove the speck from your brother's eye. We are supposed to remove specks and planks and splinters, logs, but we just got to make sure that our vision is whole. Because I don't want somebody doing surgery on me that's got a, a big beam sticking out of their eye. And so I've got to make sure that I'm applying this, this same standard, this same discipline, the same teaching, the, the, the same uh, admonition to myself first. When I hear a sermon, when I'm, when I'm attending an effort like this, the first application I need to make is to myself instead of saying, well, I hope brother so and sos here. I sure hope they were here to hear this. I need to be asking myself, what can I take away from this? What, do I, what can I do better? What do I need to apply here? It needs to be toward ourselves first. You know, in Luke chapter uh, uh, 17 and in verse 3, in Luke chapter 17, I want you to notice there in verse 3, Jesus said, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, Rebuke him if he repents, forgive him. Yeah, he's talking about if your brother sins against you and how you need to rebuke him, that's, that's the discipline we've been talking about, right? That's what we saw in Matthew 18. But you know, did you notice what he said first? Take heed to yourself. That's where it starts. 
I need to look at myself before I start getting involved in this brother who has sinned against me. In Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul's speaking to the elders at Ephesus. He's going to tell them that they have a responsibility to shepherd the flock of God that is among them. But the first thing he says is, take heed to yourself and to the flock of God over which he has made you overseers. The first thing that an elder's got to do every day is to take care of self. Think about self. Make sure you've got that right. And gospel preachers and every other Christian needs to do the very same thing. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. I buffet my body. I bring it into subjection. Why? Because I'm not going to help anyone else if I don't take care of myself first. We've got to do that before we're going to rescue the lost, before we're going to be able to help another person. And and I want to suggest to you that this, I believe, might be the most prominent thing that weakens so many people on effectively disciplining others. You think about it. I know Let's say I know that there's something in my life that's a compromise. I've been able to take care of this and I've taken care of that. I've taken care of practically everything in my life, but I've got this one little area here, this one little dark room, and and I just keep coming back to it and I I struggle with it. And Maybe it's my temper or or maybe it's evil thoughts or maybe it's it's gossip or lying or or, or filthy language in the workplace. I, I don't know. Whatever it is. That thing unaddressed, not disciplining ourselves consistently, not getting that beam out of our eye. I, there are going to be times when that person's still going to take it upon themselves to try to remove the speck from someone else's eye. But I think what happens more than that is a person just says, I, I don't need to be involved in that. I don't, I, don't, I don't have any place in doing that. And so you have a whole lot of people in a congregation that are, that are pretty much just lifeless. This is what literally takes the teeth out of any effort that is going to save and help someone. But on the other hand, if we actually do take care of self first, it's going to eliminate the need for church action. If every one of us will practice self, uh, self-discipline, the church will never have to practice church discipline. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And that's, it, It's really that simple. But not only do we need to practice it toward ourselves, we need to practice it toward a brother. In Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 23, he tells us there, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, go your way and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Make that right. Correct that wrong. Go to your brother. Now this is a case where maybe I've done something wrong and and I need to take care of that first. Matthew 18, we've already read that. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Again, it's me and a brother. You know, one of the reasons that it needs to start here is Matthew chapter 18 has been used and abused so long I've had people say, well, Brett, that's the pattern. That's the standard. Well, when, when somebody's sinning, you need to go to them. If somebody does something wrong, if somebody commits a sin over here, or if somebody's you know, uh, uh, cheated on his wife, or he's left his wife, or somebody gets up here and, and preaches rank air in the pulpit, well, nothing needs to happen until you go to him privately and personally and speak to him. Matthew chapter 18 is giving us a very specific situation. If your brother sins against you, go to him between you and him alone. We're dealing with a private sin. And what the Lord is telling us is we need to contain that in order to make it as easy as possible for that brother or that sister to repent. You know, they're not going to have to eat near as much crow if what they did to me that was a private thing, it's just between me and them, if we get that resolved and no one has to know about it, that's going to be a whole lot easier for them to take care of. I want to accommodate that. That's grace. That's mercy. I want someone to do that for me. Make it easier for me to be rescued and to come back. 
And so he says, if, if your brother sins against you, go and do that. But if he won't hear you, okay, now you need to take it to one or two more. It's still not being shared with everybody, though, is it? It's obviously going to be those who are spiritual. And we're going to be able to restore that person. But if we won't hear them, then we tell it to the church. But we need to go to a brother individually. Go to that brother first when that sin is against us. You know, in Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 1, he said, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. I think that word is better translated meekness. The spirit of gentleness or meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Notice how he combines the take heed to yourself and going to your brother. Yes, we, we have this individual responsibility that is very clear. And in James chapter 5, in James 5 and in verse 19, he says, If anyone among you wanders from the truth, someone turns him back. He's talking about an individual Christian making this personal effort toward a brother. If anyone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. The church is not even involved yet. This is something that we're doing individually. We're going to that brother. We know about something. Not everyone else knows about it. We need to go and take care of it. But again, as I was saying, Matthew 18 is talking about a private sin. You know, in Galatians chapter 2, when Peter was playing the hypocrite publicly, Paul withstood him to his face in front of them all, he said. He didn't go to him privately. Public sin dealt with publicly. The private sin is dealt with privately. But we go to a brother and we take care of that sin and try to restore that person before it is too late. And what we need to understand is it is the spirit of love that prompts this action. It is love that prompts the right spirit. In 1 Corinthians 13 and in verse 6, as he's discussing love, he said, Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. I've got to make sure that when I go to a brother that I do not have even an inkling of joy that this brother's been caught, that he's been found out, and that I have an opportunity now to dress him down and let him know everything that he's been doing wrong. That's not going to restore anyone. That spirit's going to destroy. We must have this love that never rejoices in uh, uh, iniquity, but always rejoices in truth. And when we have that spirit about us, we are properly fitted to go to our brother. And, and these are the examples that we see throughout the Old Testament in God's people. You remember when Samuel, uh, when Saul uh, uh, went and to, down to fight against Amalek, but he spared the king and the best of the possessions? And when Samuel went and told him his sin, Samuel, he told him, he said, Saul, when you were little in your own eyes, you were mighty. Samuel loved Saul. And in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 35, the Bible says, Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. He had the right spirit. He loved that man. He anointed him as king. You know, Ezra, when the people came to him and confessed their sin uh, regarding their unscriptural marriages, in Ezra chapter 10 and verse 6, Ezra rose up from before the house of God, went into the chamber, and when he came there, he ate no bread, drank no water, for he mourned because of the guilt of those from the captivity. That's that spirit. That's that spirit of brotherly love that's going to restore a brother. Moses for Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Notice in verse 18 and in verse 25, Moses said that God had said he was going to destroy all of the children of Israel. And what did Moses do? He said, I lay prostrate on the ground for 40 days and 40 nights I didn't eat or drink and I lay on the ground and pled with God. We need more brethren that have that measure of love for their brothers and sisters in Christ. And you're going to see church discipline doing wonders for those that fall away. When people really do have that kind of of love for their brethren. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, or in Romans chapter 9 and in verse 13, he said, I would be willing myself to be lost if I could save all of my brethren, the Jews. That's love. 
That's incredible. This love for our brethren is essential because that's what fits us to restore him. You know, when we read there in Galatians chapter 6, in Galatians chapter 6 and verses in verse 1, if a man is overtaken in trespass, you who are spiritual restore such one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Then he says in verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, it's a, it's a burden to go to someone and try to restore them. I don't know anyone who enjoys it. And if they do, they probably need some professional attention. It is not a pleasant thing to do. It is a heavy burden to carry. But if we love our brother, we're going to let go of the things that are easy to do, that are pleasant to do, and we're going to make that difficult drive or walk, journey to their house where we can meet with them and express our love and our concern for them. And did you notice in verse 1 he said, you who are spiritual? There, it, it, he's saying there are some people that are fit, that are right for this restoration work. Well, who are those who are spiritual? Well, he explains it. Just go up to chapter 5 in the last few verses there. He said in verse 24, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. That's the spiritual person. They live in the Spirit. They walk in the Spirit. There's no conceit. There's no provoking. There's no envying. That's the person that needs to go and restore them. And that's the Spirit that must be alive and well. But not only does the individual have a responsibility toward a brother or a sister who may be caught up in some sin or some trespass, but also the elders of a local church have that responsibility. Remember we saw in Acts chapter 20 and in verse 28, he said, Take heed to yourself and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers. The elders, the Holy Spirit has revealed that elders must give an account for every soul in that local church of which they oversee. That's a frightening thought. That's a sobering thought. I know I'm going to give an account, you know, within my family and, and how I've led my family, and I'm going to give an account for myself, and that's a pretty big job. But I've got to give an account for every soul over which I oversee. I'll keep you awake at night. That's a big job. You think seriously about the work of elders and what that really means. Is he shepherding the way he should? And what that means is when there's a brother or a sister that's persisting in sin, that is impenitent, yes, the elders need to be brought in on that. Now, it may be a private sin between them and you alone, and so you can go and have that restored and, 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 and taken care of. The elders never need to know about it. This person repents. It's all good. But if we're talking about a situation where they won't hear you, and they're not turning. If there are elders in the church, remember we saw in Galatians 6 and verse 1, you who are spiritual restore such one. There's no one in the church more qualified to do that than the shepherds of that local congregation. That's when they need to be brought in. They need to be involved in it right away. And let me, let me say this. So many times I've seen in congregations that there is a family or families that take it upon themselves when there is sin in the life of one member of their family, they take it upon themselves to circle the wagons, close ranks, and keep everything in-house. They put a gag, order on, a, go, a gag order on every member of the family. We don't talk about this. We're going to take care of this here. And all that accomplishes is incubating that sin. Now, I understand that if we're talking about immediately... We're going to go to this person. We're going to try to accomplish something. I understand that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a sin that has grown to a catastrophic level. It's a serious matter. And this person has persisted and persisted and persisted in it. And maybe it's out of pride that this family doesn't want other people to know what's going on. Or they don't trust the elders or the men of the congregation. They can handle this. They can take care of this. I want you to find that for me in the book of God. We haven't seen that, not one stitch of it in the pattern 
Again, I'm not talking about the initial approach. I'm talking about keeping something in-house and a secret from the men of the congregation or where there's elders from the elders. And as I said, all you're going to do is incubate the sin. I've seen it happen too many times. Far too many times. It's that situation where somebody sees a warning sign, a red flag, and they go to that person early on and they say, hey, I'm worried about you. And that person's offended. They take offense to this. And all their family is offended. Well, I can't believe you went and talked to him about that. Well, that's none of your business. You need to stay out of it. And then lo and behold, two months later, six months later, this young man is involved in that very sin. They're not going to let that out. They're going to close ranks. You seen that? You seen that happen? That will destroy a congregation. And this is the reason the elders must know what's going on. They have that responsibility as shepherds to protect this person, to heal the wounded. That was what God rebuked the, the shepherds of Israel, the spiritual shepherds of Israel, because they had not bound up that which was wounded. That's exactly what elders need to be doing. They need to bring that salve to try to heal this one who has fallen away. The elders need to be involved. But I, but I want to also point out here, the elders need to be involved with those that are among them. It is not the elders' responsibility to be involved in the life of some member of another church. Elders have authority and they're shepherding the flock that is among them. 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 1, the elders who are among you I exhort whom a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. He goes on and says in verse 2, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. That is the responsibility. It is within that local church. He says in verse 9, Holding fast the faithful word as he's been, able, as he's been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate. There's that idea again. Insubordinate. There are many insubordinate, both idle and uh, both idle, he says, uh, idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Elders need to be on top of it, but it is within that local church. Yes, this, this is something we haven't brought out or talked about, but Church discipline is a local action. The elders of a local church have that delegated authority from Christ to lead in this action. A congregation has authority from Christ. Remember Paul said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, along with my spirit, deliver such a one to Satan. The local church has the authority of Christ to practice discipline toward those named a brother among them. That, that, that church has that authority. A local church does not have authority like that over another Christian out here. Now, we have a responsibility as Christians to try to restore any lost Christian individually. But as a congregation, our responsibility is toward those that are among us. And so, what about someone who's been withdrawn from here and their relationship to other churches. Well, that's what those other churches have got to decide. But, but here's the problem that arises, and it's arisen for us many times. You may have a person who comes in here to place membership, and they've been marked or withdrawn from by another congregation. What's your responsibility? A person that you've marked or withdrawn from leaves here and goes to place membership at another congregation. You visit a gospel meeting, and they're up leading singing. They're being... They, they've had full fellowship and, 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 a, and good relationship extended to that person. But what about that? Well, churches are autonomous. We don't have authority to tell another church what to do. But here's what we can do. Remember, even though th this local church is autonomous and where, where I work, the Southside Church of Christ, has no authority over this congregation, you have no authority over that congregation, but you know what we have in common? We want to see every person in this world saved, don't we? And so if I know that a member here has been withdrawn from and they want to place membership there, we're going to ask them before, they, before we accept them as a member, have you been marked anywhere? Have you been withdrawn from? That's, that's one of the things that we do before someone places membership. 
And, and do you, the place that you just came from, is there anyone there that, that can speak on your behalf? And so that we can be certain that there's, you didn't leave a problem there. We find out that they've been withdrawn from, and this has certainly happened a number of times there at Southside. They need to go take care of that. If, if we have the ability, we'll look at some of the evidence, but th they need to make that right. They need to resolve that. Christians ought to be able to take care of that. That needs to be the first effort. We're not going to accept someone who has been withdrawn from by another congregation, especially when the evidence is there that they've done something wrong. And we would hope that another congregation would do that as well because if we withdrawn from someone, our effort was not just to hurt them, not just to, to shun them. Our effort is to save their soul. And so if they go to another congregation and they're just taken in, that, that's not going to help them be saved. We want to help them be saved. And that's going to affect even our relationship with another congregation. I'm not saying congregations have relationships, but as far as am I going to go over there and support them and what they do when they're in fellowship with somebody that's not in fellowship with God? Ah, it, yes, that's happened to us in a number of congregations in Kansas City. People we've withdrawn from have gone and placed membership at other congregations. One congregation has made this fellow an elder that we withdrew from. You think that doesn't make things awkward? And, and that's not helping anyone. But what we've got to take care of is within the local church that we're a member of. Yeah, it may impact the relationship that I have as far as support of another congregation, gospel meetings or singings or whatever. But as far as authority and our responsibility, it's going to be here in a local congregation. And that's what the elders are to oversee in that particular regard. But then once the elders are involved, the next step is to tell it to the church in Matthew chapter 18 and in verse 17. Now, if there are no elders, obviously we're going to see a case where we're, we may take it to one or two more. And then it's told to the church. We see there in Matthew chapter 18 and in verse 17. If he will not hear, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. I want you to notice there, he's talking about the fact that before church discipline, uh, before withdrawal takes place, before we withdraw ourselves from someone, the church needs to know about it. And did you notice he said, if they will not hear the church? Brethren, the, the, the thing that is so important here, because we've talked about the meaning of discipline, we've talked about the fact that discipline is in teaching, it is in fellowship, it is in encouragement, uh, admonition. We, we share a relationship as brethren. We're commanded to be hospitable. We're to have our homes open to one another and to strengthen those bonds between us. And when all of that kind of discipline is taking place on the positive end, whenever it gets to the, to the negative end, when we're having to take punitive action, it's going to be a whole lot more effective. A whole lot more effective. Now, what if we didn't do what we're supposed to do on this end? What if we could have done better and, and we didn't develop as good a relationship and there wasn't as much teaching as we had liked? Well, we still got to do the right thing. I've still got to do the right thing. You know, if, if I haven't handled things right with my children and I've made some mistakes, I've been negligent, a part of their rebellion is my fault, but they're still rebelling and I'm telling them what you're doing is wrong and, and look, I'll admit, I haven't handled this right in the past and I believe a part of this rebellion is, is my negligence and I'm going to repent. And from here on out, I'm going to do it right. And the first thing I'm going to do right is I'm going to be consistent with my discipline. And so I'm going to punish you for this. Yeah, somebody says, oh Brett, that's not going to do much good if you, if you haven't been doing this over here. I agree but it's going to be a whole lot worse if I don't do anything. We have a command from God to do the right thing, and if we fail to do the right thing, the only thing we can do now is the right thing. And the right thing is to withdraw from a brother who walks disorderly. And we need to acknowledge that brother. You know what? We understand. We failed in these areas. We want to repent of that. You know, there's a lot of churches that need to repent. That might be the first thing the church needs to do. The whole congregation, repent. We haven't been doing what we need to do. 
and building these bonds and in the teaching and, and having more men studies. The ladies are good about having studies. Sometimes the men aren't. We need to be more involved in those things, but that doesn't take away our responsibility to do what we need to do right now. And so that role is to the church to, to withdraw, but before that withdrawal happens, notice he said, if they will not hear the church, that tells me that as a congregation, the, this person needs to hear from all of us. I don't know how many times we've stood up before the congregation and pled with them. This brother or this sister, we've been reaching out to them, we've been working with them, and they're obstinate. We're making no progress. And so we're telling it to the church, and we need you. Send them a card. Make a phone call. Go by and see them. Please. And you know there's some members of the church that, I'm gonna let the, that's the elders deal, I'm going to let them handle it. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, if he will not hear the church. And I'll tell you some of the most powerful and impacting things that have happened when we've done that. People have been restored because we've had a teenage girl sit down and write the most tender, appealing, loving note of warning and pleading with this man to come back, expressing her appreciation for the things that he's done to encourage other people and, and the good things that she's seen in his life. But, but right now, this is such a discouragement and this is bringing reproach on the church. And he said that that was the thing that completely demolished the, the works of the flesh. You remember for the destruction of the flesh? You never know who it might be this was not a young woman that had this, this close, close relationship with this particular brother. But from afar, she had seen things she appreciated. And she took it upon herself when we appealed to the church to write or to call or to go see. Probably wouldn't have been as appropriate for her to go see him or to call him. But you know that card? It was powerful. And you need to realize that before you withdraw, there needs to be extensive encouragement and effort that there be total solidarity. They need to hear from the church. When you are gathered together, over and over again, we see this brought out in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 4. In 1 Corinthians 5 and in verse 5, verse 7, verse 13, when you're gathered together. And let me say this, if some in the church refuse to withdraw themselves, then they're refusing to submit to the elders. And by extension, they're refusing to submit to Christ. And they themselves are disorderly. You ever thought about that? When a congregation decides that it's time to withdraw? And, and, and you know, this, this, you know, sometimes we, we wonder, well, how do we know when it's that time? I mean, what if there's a few people that disagree and, and they're not ready to do that? You know, what you've got to have within a local church to work is, is what's called consensus. Not majority rule, but consensus. When I first moved there to Southside, we, we didn't have elders. We were in, in a business, men's business meeting, and, and brother said, well, unless we all agree, we can't do this. No, that's, that's not accurate. We're not always going to agree on everything. We, we just, we're just not going to. But we can have consensus. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, consensus is where we're willing to yield on some things, you know? I mean, the, the time that you meet on the Lord's Day, I bet not everybody agrees that that's the best time. You know, there was a time that growing up that we met on the Lord's Day, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. I did not like the time that was chosen. I didn't agree with it. Didn't think it was best. But I yielded. I did it. We had consensus. It wasn't something I was going to put my foot down. It wasn't something that, that caused me to sin. And that's what we've got to understand is that for a local church to work, we all have to have a yielding spirit. Is this sinful? Am I, agree, am I going to have to agree to something that is going to make me complicit in sin? No. Okay. Then this may not be my preference, but it is one way to do it that is right. Then I'm going to have to yield. Are we going to do it this week or are we going to wait three weeks? 
Well, there's some people that are going to say, I think we ought to wait. Other people say, I think we ought to do it now. At some point, there's going to have to be a consensus where we yield and we work together. So please understand that. If you say that everybody's got to have complete agreement on every matter of judgment, you're going to hamstring the church and nothing's going to get done. What we need is that spirit of meekness and humility and a willing to yield on things where we don't have to have our way. It happens all the time. That's just a part of making a relationship work. It happens in a marriage. It happens in all relationships. So what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we have that consensus, that we tell it to the church, and that, that is who is responsible in these matters of corrective discipline. And then we also wanted to look at the question of how should discipline be carried out? How do we carry out corrective church discipline? Well, first things first. What would that be? We're talking about someone who's guilty of sin. Maybe it's false teaching. Maybe it's the works of the flesh. Maybe they've sinned against a brother. Maybe it's an elder who sinned. Maybe they're, they're just disorderly in some way. Maybe they're forsaking the assembly habitually. And so, how do we carry this out? The first thing, is to determine the certainty of the guilt or the innocence. We've got to make sure that what we're looking at is, is what is right. And this has always been required as we look going back to the Old Testament. This is exactly what God required. Always. Notice with me here in Deuteronomy in chapter 13 and in verse 14. The Bible says, Then you shall inquire, talking about someone who has tried to urge people to go out and serve idols. He said, you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. And if it's indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed against you, among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city. That's always been God's requirement. You remember in the book of Joshua, in chapter 22, when there were the tribes that had settled on the east side of the Jordan, they built an altar, and the rest of the tribes of Israel said, they built an altar over there that they're bowing down to and they're not worshiping God and, and we need to go and kill them. Well, hold on. They decided to send Phineas and a few others to go and inquire and find out. And so they went and they talked to these tribes, Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh. And when they went and talked to them, the, these tribes, they said, yes, it's true. We built this altar, but not to worship here. It is an altar so that you will remember that we belong to you. So that your children don't say, well, we don't have any part with them. They're on the other side of the river. We want you to remember that we have a part in everything that's done on the other side of the river. Phineas rejoiced. They had... They had avoided total catastrophe because there was a lot of assumption that was made. You ever do that? I've done it. I've assumed the worst. I saw something. I thought, that looks terrible. And I began to construct it in my mind, and I had the worst scenario playing out. Even went and talked to another person about it. I, I wanted to go with me and, and to address it. We finally went and talked to the people and found out that the person I saw was not who I thought I saw. It was not even what I thought was happening. We've got to be really, really careful. We need to determine the certainty of the guilt or of the innocence. That has always been God's will. And I want to tell you, it's still God's will. That's exactly what Matthew chapter 18 is talking about in verse 16 when he said, Take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, what? Every word may be established. It's not enough for you to go to the church on your own and to say, well, so-and-so did this. He said, you need to take a few with you first and make sure that what you're hearing is what you think you're hearing, that every word may be established. Yeah, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and in verse 19, Paul said, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. We need to establish the fact of it. That's, the, that's where we start. And you know what? That in and of itself is going to help 
the person we're trying to restore to say, you know what, I, I think too much of you to just believe this. I just got to ask you, is this true? Is this what's going on? And we might need to ask, you know, as, as God said there in Deuteronomy, inquire diligently. We need to make sure that we know how to ask the right questions. I've seen far too many times where a person is being um, less than honest. They know how to answer a question in a deceptive way and make you think what maybe you want to believe. We might need to learn how to ask questions better. We need to ask diligently, but we do need to make sure about the certainty of the guilt. But that being done, then we need to warn that person. We need to make them aware of their sin. 1 Thessalonians 5 and in verse 14, he said, Warn those who are unruly. That's what Matthew 18 is all about in verse 15 through 17. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he won't hear you, take with you one or two more. What is that to do? It is to let this person know, hey, we don't want to keep taking this up the chain. We don't want this to go any further. Please repent. It is making them aware of their sin. It is warning them about that sin. You know, in Titus chapter 3, he says in verse 10, Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning. Did you notice that? First and second admonition. You know, an admonition is a warning. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spirits of songs. We need, we need to sing those songs that warn us. I think some brethren kind of want to get away from some of those older songs that, you know, that, that warn us you know, about the coming judgment day. No, we, we're to teach and admonish in these songs. We're to warn. But in this case, we, we need to make sure that that, a, that admonition is taking place and that it's, and that it's being done in, in every effort. Warn the disorderly. And, and let me suggest something else. In Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 21, Revelation 2 and verse 21, the Lord said, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. There needs to be sufficient time that is given. What is that? Obviously, it's judgment. It's going to be different in different circumstances, different situations. This is the reason that ideally we have elders who are spiritually minded men, qualified to be able to make decisions about that kind of a thing, and no matter what time is chosen, some are going to say it's too soon. Some are going to say it's, it, 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 uh, you know, uh, we waited too long. But there needs to be a sufficient amount of time for that person to come to their senses, to come to themselves, and to repent. I can't tell you exactly what that is, but I believe that we can know. Here's the thing to remember. God wants us to succeed in this. He's going to guide us. We pray and ask for wisdom. What does James say that he'll give us? James chapter 1. Down through verse 5. If we ask, He will give us that wisdom. And so we warn the disorderly. And then, after that warning, and this is a part of that time to repent, we need to do an audit. Essentially, personal audit. Has there been sincere, diligent, long-suffering effort to restore this person? And I'm not saying that, that we need to hobble the church and make this thing last three years because that's not going to help. Swift punishment is much more effective than drawing this thing out for over a year. I'm not saying do that. This can be done in a relatively short amount of time if we will drop all of the temporal things of this world, all of our hobbies, all of our interests, and we focus on saving this person. But make sure Maybe we come together and we have a prayer service for this brother or this sister. We do that every fifth Sunday. Every fifth Sunday, we, come, we, we have a prayer service. Because there's a number of folks that we've withdrawn from. You know, a big part of our evangelistic work is to save those who've fallen away. We pray for those people. Sometimes that... That is, is the, the best thing that we can do. But sincere, diligent, long-suffering effort. I've reached out. They wouldn't answer their phone, so I left a message. I text them. I sent an email. I stopped by the house. I left a note on the door. I've made, I've made tender appeals, and I've made some strong admonition. 
I'm using everything that I've got. And when we are confident that we've made that sincere, diligent, long-suffering effort to restore, we, we want to make sure that those who are spiritual have, have sought to restore that person. In 2 Timothy 4 and in verse 2, he said, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. And listen to this, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. I want to be as patient as the Lord is patient. That doesn't mean that it's going to go on forever. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, warn those who are unruly. But you know what? Notice what else he said? Comfort the faint-hearted. Sometimes that's what needs to be done. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. Be patient with all. The weak, the faint-hearted, and even the rebellious. Be patient. Understand you're dealing with a soul, with God's child. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Diligent, long-suffering effort. But if they refuse to repent, then we're to withdraw. Matthew 18, verse 17, Let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Reject him after the first and second admonition. Titus 3, in verses 10 through 11. What the Bible says is withdraw yourself. There has to be a time where we've got to be willing to bite the bullet and do the hard thing. That time has to come. There has to be a consensus. And we withdraw ourselves so that, as we saw last night, that they may be ashamed. When they see that all godly, righteous children of God will not have an association with them, it is to stir up that guilt to the point of shame and to hopefully bring them back. This is a last resort. Now that doesn't mean that it ends here. Church discipline doesn't end when we withdraw. That's the beginning of that final stage. And we're going to continue to reach out. We're going to admonish him as a brother. We're going to be looking for every opportunity for the gospel to penetrate this person's heart. We're going to, be, we're, we're going to share with them the goodness and the severity of God. We're not going to be shopping with them. We're not going to be going on, on hunting trips. We're not going to be having that kind of relationship with them. But we are going to continue to pursue opportunities to admonish them as a brother. And as I said, one of the greatest opportunities is for them to hear the songs of admonition, the sermons calling on them to repent, to see true, pure worship without certainly being allowed to lead or to have, have some kind of a, a role in that. But we definitely want to admonish them. Any opportunity to admonish them, we're authorized to do that. We'll talk more about that tomorrow morning. But if they refuse to repent, there has to be a time that we withdraw. And then, having made that decision that we will withdraw ourselves, we need to do so openly, publicly. You know, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan. This is not something that is to be done in a back room. This is not something to be done, that is to be done secretly and, and cloak and dagger style. We need to be willing to do this openly and publicly. We're going to tell the congregation, we have all tried to reach this person and they will not repent. And so we must take this final step. And as painful as it will be for us, it is the highest act of love that we can show for this person because this isn't pleasant for us. It's not comfortable. It's not happy. It, it, is, it, it, it puts us out to have to do this. But we're going to withdraw ourselves from them. And we're going to make that announcement. We're going to mark that person. It is going to be something we do as a congregation with solidarity when we are gathered together. I was telling one of the members here, we had a, a young couple that came over visiting with us. They visited for quite a number uh, of, of months. 
and I, I, I would ask them, hey, have you, you thought about placing membership? Yeah, we're, we're still thinking about it. Well, we had a situation arise in the congregation with a member there that we were doing everything we could to rescue this brother, a, a, a beloved brother there in the congregation, but he was obstinate, and he would not repent. And so we finally reached the point that we had to tell the congregation, and as we were assembled, we announced that we've had to withdraw. We, we must withdraw from this brother, and we ask for your prayers. We ask for you to continue doing anything you can to admonish him as a brother, but we cannot have we cannot eat with such a one. We, we cannot keep company with such a one. We must withdraw from this brother. And so uh, the young man wrote me that night and said, I've never been a member of a church that's ever done what y'all did tonight. I've always read the New Testament about that topic, but I've never seen a church actually do it. And he said, this is true Christianity. The next week, they placed membership with us. They came from a church that did not practice church discipline. We would have thought that that would have turned them off, what we were doing. We had to do the right thing. And in fact, they were drawn to that pure, true New Testament Christianity. Let's never second-guess God. We always do the right thing. It needs to be done openly. It needs to be done in a way that shows that we're not ashamed of what we're doing. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 20, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Well, tomorrow night we're going to get into the subject that is rarely, if ever, dealt with, which I've never heard it dealt with. It's the reason that, that this is the issue that prompted me to do this in-depth study of church discipline, and that is what are our, what's our responsibility toward a family member who's been withdrawn from? That's the first thing we'll look at tomorrow morning, and then we will be discussing how the disorderly are to be treated. I appreciate your kind attention tonight, and I realize this is a longer than usual uh, service, having two hours of, uh, of, of time like this, but I think that this is so important, and it is going to be so crucial for the growth and the welfare of this congregation. Uh, I just want to thank you for doing it and allowing this format for us to cover it. And I want to tell you, this is the best format to cover a topic like this, by the way. If we were to, to do this all week long and stretch it out, or, you know, as, as what I do at home when I preach on it, it's one Sunday and then another lesson the next Sunday, it's spread out a week in between. When we are able to do a, a, a very uh, uh, intense study of it, everything is still fresh in our mind when we go to the next study and the next lesson. So what you've done here, I think, has been very good and I appreciate so much. And we invite you to be back tomorrow morning. Uh, what time does services start tomorrow morning? 9.30. All right. We hope you'll be here at 9.30 and join us. We don't want to leave tonight without extending to you the invitation of Jesus Christ. That is the invitation to come to Him, believing in Him as the Christ, the Son of God, to confess your faith in Him publicly tonight, to repent of your sins, and to be baptized in water for the remission of sins. That's the most important thing that you could take care of tonight anything else that you could do. And if you need to obey the gospel, why not tonight? Why not? Why would you go home knowing that if the Lord comes back, you will spend absolute eternity in insufferable pain, so great that the Lord did not have sufficient words to be able to convey to us what that eternity will be like. Have you thought about it? And there's no need for it because you could come tonight and be forgiven of all your sins. If as a child of God there's anything in your life that's separating you from the Lord, make that right and do it tonight. Make that known. We'll pray with you and for, and for you, but whatever your need is, please come while we stand and sing the invitation song.